Psalm 13. Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me, agony in my mind every day? How long will my enemy dominate me? Consider me an answer, Lord my God. Restore brightness to my eyes, otherwise I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have triumphed over him, and my foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your deliverance. I will sing to the Lord because he has treated me generously. So I got a text last night from Jeff saying that he was feeling unwell. He wasn't thinking he was going to be here and asking me if I happened to have a sermon in my back pocket that I could preach. And I said, well, no, I don't, but, you know, I could do my Amway presentation. And he said, sure, that would be great. He didn't say that. Yeah, so this is sort of a, something of a last-minute thing. I'm not exactly sure how long it will be, but I'll try to keep an eye on the clock. And, uh, yeah, because, uh, yeah, all right. Anyway, um, so this morning, this morning, um, while I ate my breakfast, I spent some time trying to kind of crystallize and organize and put together some thoughts that have been sort of evolving in me over the past week. Last Sunday, uh, when I got home from church, I went home and I, I looked at Facebook and discovered that um, the daughter of a friend had um, posted a suicide note on Facebook and then disappeared, and that they had been unable to find her. That was uh, the first of three bad news things that kind of hit this week. And one of them is just dealing with a sort of a major crisis of depression and anxiety. And another one is she ha has been the victim of a crime and she's struggling with walking through the process, the legal process and the justice system. And she's having a hard time with that. So uh, yeah, there was a lot of bad news last week. And it starts to get to you after a while. It starts to just color the way you see everything. But um, yesterday, uh, yesterday I went to Campbellford, where my friend's daughter lived. And my friend's name is Annie. And uh, she's someone I've kept in touch with over the years on Facebook mostly. And uh, I hadn't actually seen her for a few years. We hadn't been in the same room together for a while. But, uh, you know, I, I definitely wanted to be there to try to help with this search party that, that had been organized by uh, another woman, a friend of her family. And uh, so I drove up there yesterday. And um, there were about, uh, about 50 of us all sort of waiting in the parking lot for Annie and her other kids to arrive so that we would uh, begin the search when they got there. Annie's car pulled into the parking lot and I was just standing there in, in this group of about 50 people. I didn't know any of them because they're all friends and family. And you know, I, just, I was from out of town, so I didn't know any of these people. But uh, Annie got out of the car, and she just kind of like saw me through the crowd. And she just started walking towards me, just like this. Just walking through the crowd with her arms open and just coming straight at me. And she just kept coming until we were toe to toe, and her arms were around me and my arms were around her. And we just stood there for like a minute, which is <laughs> kind of a long time. But we just stood there while everybody else waited, probably wondering who the heck I was. And um, she was shaking and crying and <laughs> I was feeling completely useless because I want to say something. I want to have something to say that's going to help. And I had nothing. So I just stood there and I waited until she finally patted me on the back and stepped back. And then she just went, she had to go and talk to the woman who was organizing the search. And I didn't get to talk to Annie much that day because it wasn't that kind of a day. 
We, uh, we spent several hours looking in different places around town. There was a big group who um, did a, a sort of an organized sweep of, uh, if you know Campbellford, of uh, Ferris Park. They just sort of did the best they could with all the snow and the shrubbery and everything. And uh, a smaller group of us went to a few particular places around town, um, a place on the edge of town where we know that um, addicts sometimes hang out. We thought she might have gone there. Uh, there was a place where a, a year previously, a friend of hers had been found after she had commit, committed suicide, so we thought maybe she had gone there. And there was um, a couple of places where she and her sister had been happy as kids, and we looked at those places, but there was no sign of her. And uh, the day ended with, you know, we know where she's not, but we don't know exactly where she is. So that's kind of an ongoing thing, but all through that week, when I first found out about that, the, I, I started thinking about Psalm 13. And Psalm 13 has been sort of dogging me all week through the, through the things that, uh, the news that, that I've been hearing and the, and the struggles that people are having, and I can't do anything to help. I just know that they're hurting. And, I mean, Psalm 13 is an example of why, you know, the Bible is so awesome. Not only is the scripture inspired by God, the one who created us, who created the entire universe, who put everything in motion and, and keeps a loving hand on everything that happens. Not only was it inspired by him, but it was written through people like us. People who um, lived in families and communities and people who were just individuals and, and students and, and teachers and builders and soldiers and housewives and, and travelers. And these are the people who wrote these words. You know, they lived their lives in imperfect ways. You know, I mean, we have this, this amazing record of all these failures, of all the, the things that all these people got wrong. And, and it's also honest and it's also open and it's also raw sometimes, especially um, I find in the book of Psalms. Psalms, um, Psalms are poetry, and poetry comes from a very deep place. If you are a poet, you are trying to use words to express something that is inexpressible, whether it's you know, the beauty of a sunset or um, the irritation of your neighbor's dog barking at two o'clock in the morning, or whatever it is. You are trying to use words to express things that are almost inexpressible. And um, in the Psalms, they're, they're so honest and they are so, they're so big in the way they express things. And, and sometimes it's joy. Sometimes it's passion and joy and love and, and uh, isn't God amazing and look at the world that he created and, and you know, how can we remain silent? We have to sing. And, and sometimes it's anger. It's, why is the world like this? Why, God, are you letting this happen? And I just love the fact that the psalmists were honest enough to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God and to say, you know what? This is awful. Why are you letting this happen? Don't you see that I'm hurting? Don't you see that I'm lonely? Don't you see that these people are coming against me? Don't you see that it's unfair? They were honest enough to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God and to be honest. I mean, you just look at the, uh, look at the life of David. He was one of, one of the psalm writers. And if you look at, at his, his life, uh, there's not a disaster that you can think of that he did not experience. There's not a thing that can go wrong in a person's life, whether it's their own fault or somebody else's, that he didn't deal with. He went through everything imaginable, and he still continued to love God and to serve him and to follow him in spite of his honesty, in spite of his, his pain that he was so open about expressing in the Psalms that he wrote. But even more powerfully than that, I think, um, is the example of Jesus. You know, it, you look at the life of Jesus, and I mean, we have these beautiful windows that, that 
tell the story through, through certain episodes in his life that were pivotal and important. We tend mostly to focus on the first one, the baby in the manger, and the last one, when he rose from the dead, when he was crucified and died and buried. We tend to focus the most on those two events in his life. Those are sort of the ones that, that hit us the most strongly. But in between, you know, in, a, in the blank space between the windows, in all that, that white paint, there are minutes and seconds and hours and moments and days and conversations and journeys and jobs that he had to do day after day after day after day. And he lived the life that we live. He experienced everything that we can experience. He suffered everything that we can suffer. He started out as a baby, learning to walk, learning to speak a particular language. He grew as a child. He sat in school and listened to his teachers and did his homework. He got hungry, even to the point where the, the enemy tempted him, you know, your kingdom for bread. Um, he could be surprised. He, in, he encountered faith in people where he did not expect to encounter that faith, and he, it would surprise him, and he would be delighted by that. He got angry at things that he knew were unfair and wrong, and that people were, were behaving hypocritically. Um, there were things that he didn't know, things that he had to wait to find out. There were things that he did just because he was supposed to and because that was what the Father had told him to do. There were things that he wanted so badly and that he cried out to God saying, please, please, please. He cried at the death of a friend. He hugged people and he held their hands. And he empathized with people who were hungry or grieving or in pain. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 5, the writer of Hebrews, we don't, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. My, my personal, the one I'm rooting for is um, Priscilla, because I think it would be awesome to be able to open the Bible and turn to the book of Priscilla. I just, I think that would be cool. But in the book of Hebrews, we read this. During his earthly life, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. He was heard. He cried out words like the words that we see in Psalm 13. Why have you left me in this mess? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to suffer all this? Why can't you just take me out of this and do it some other way? And the Bible says, because of his reverence, he was heard. It doesn't say that God gave him what he wanted. There were times even Jesus didn't get what he wanted when he prayed. All he could do was trust the Father to do what was right and to carry on doing what he himself had been given to do. To the point that on the cross, Jesus looks to the Psalms for words to express his inexpressible. He looks at the Psalm 22. He takes the, the difficult, awkward honesty of Psalm 22, and he uses it to say what he's feeling on the cross. He's crying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? Jesus felt alone. He felt abandoned. He felt forsaken, even by the Father. And he turned to the words of the Psalms like I turned to Psalm 13 this week. When Jesus was on the cross, that hug between me and my friend this week, between me and Annie, that hug last night just crystallized in my mind as being the way I need to approach something like Psalm 13. 
rather than keeping my distance, rather than just, you know, saying, okay, intellectually, yeah, I see that, it's over there, that's a thing that happened, it's an interesting piece of poetry. I need to look at Psalm 13 from across the parking lot, and I need to walk towards that awkwardness and that pain with my arms open, and I need to just keep walking towards this gift that God has given us until I stand toe to toe with the awkwardness and the pain and let myself be embraced by it to say, yeah, you know what? This, this situation is awful. I can't even, I don't even know what would be worse than, than the situation that we are in right now. Whatever that is for you, wherever you find yourself, we are free to walk towards God with our arms open and our eyes open and to say, I got nothing. This hurts. And I don't know what to do. And he promises that he will hear us. He promises that he will embrace us. He promises that we will not be alone. So we get to the point in the sermon where we ask, so what? I'm a bit of a Bible geek. I love digging into the, the original languages and, you know, what did that really mean and how has that changed and what have the different translations and how does it fit together with what she said when he said that and, you know, what was going on over there. I love that stuff. I absolutely, I, I just geek out on that stuff. I absolutely love it. But the very best sermons I have ever heard always end with a, so what? What does it matter? Why should I care? What difference is it going to make when I get out of bed tomorrow morning? Sometimes the Bible gives us clear answers. Sometimes the Bible gives us clear direction and it says yes to this and no to that. And we know that that is what God intends for us. But life, most of life is not yes or no questions. That old joke about yes or no, have you stopped beating your wife? Well, you can't answer that question, <laughs> yes or no, without admitting that you were beating your wife in the first place. It's, it's, it's an impossible question to ask, yes or no. Most of life is not yes or no questions. And sometimes the very best gift that scripture can give us, that God can give us through his word, is simply the knowledge that we are not alone. That as part of the human race, we share these emotions, we share these experiences, losses and joys. That as part of this church family, we share each other's burdens. We help each other carry those burdens. We walk with each other through the hard times. As part of my own family, with my, my brother and my sisters, as my, my, my nieces and nephews, they know that anything I can do to help them, I will. And I know the same is true of them if I were in trouble. And on top of all that, God never leaves us alone. He never abandons us. Even when we can't feel, when we can't hear, when we can't see him, he's there. He promises that. That is a solid, solid promise. And it means that we can say with the, worst, with the psalmist, we can say, I have trusted in your faithfulness, and my heart will rejoice in your deliverance. I will sing to the Lord, for he has treated me generously. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this is such a gift that you've given us. These words on pages that have been handed down from generation to generation to generation and on into the future. 
It's such a gift to hear your voice, to hear the voices of others who we know have gone through life. Such a gift to know that your son, your own son, lived a life like ours and walked these paths in his own pain, his own disappointment, his own confusion and loss, and alongside friends who are going through the same thing. It's such a gift to know that he was faithful and that he will be faithful to us. Heavenly Father, whatever happens this week, whatever doesn't happen this week that we wished would, we know that you are with us. We know that you carry those things along with us and that we are never alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.